It is curriculum season, meaning this is the time when a lot of us are thinking about what we want to use for next year. And in this video, we're going to talk about the best way to set and manage your homeschool budget. How can you organize your curriculum purchases so that they are the most effective and economical for you in the coming year? If you're interested in that, stay tuned. Hi everybody, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor, lawyer, turned homeschool mom of three kids ages 11, eight, and six. This is our fifth year of homeschooling and if you are interested in videos about secular homeschooling, raising a child with ADHD, and living a more essentialist lifestyle, you have come to the right place, so be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. If you don't wanna miss any videos going forward, be sure to hit that notification bell. Down. In today's video, I'm participating in a collab hosted by Angie over at Science Mama. If you haven't checked out Angie's channel, Science Mama yet, be sure to do so. I will leave all her channel information as well as the channel links for the five other moms participating in this collab in my description box down below. Angie's channel is a particularly good channel to check out if you are a secular homeschooler. She does a great job comparing like option A and option B that a lot of us have for a lot of the top curricula that are out there. For example, when we are trying to weigh, you know, our choices between two different science curricula or two different writing curricula, she does a really good job of comparing them and giving thought out, well-reasoned uh, arguments for why she chose one over the other. In today's video, all of us will be discussing homeschool budgeting, whether we have one, if we do, how do we maintain one, what is the purpose for our family of having one, and how we generally stay on track or implement one during curriculum buying season. In our case, we don't have a set homeschool budget, meaning I don't have a number that I'm aiming for. We don't have any state funding. There is no budget list that I'm required to keep for our state or anything like that. However, if I spent an inordinate amount of money, I would not only be disappointed in myself, I think my husband would wonder <laughs> why we were spending thousands of dollars on books. I have a very extensive home library. I always have my entire life. I remember in high school, my parents bought me this giant bookshelf and I told them at the time, this would not be enough of a bookshelf. And my dad assured me it would. And then he ended up having to go back to the furniture store buying me another matching one because as I said, it was not enough, even in high school, for my book collection. So I actually, the bookshelves you see behind me are bookshelves that I picked up from a retiring bookstore owner. So they are actually custom made bookshelves for a bookshop. They are solid wood and I love them so much. He actually had 12 to sell. I only bought eight because of homeschool budgeting. Not really, but hopefully one would think it was because of homeschool budgeting. Anyway, I veered off topic with my love of bookshelves. My point is I have quite an extensive library. So as somebody who's already done a lot of educational book shopping, most of it, I would say 85% of it at thrift stores, it's important for me to rein it in. I have a book buying problem. A couple of years ago, I did a no buy year and I informed my husband that, you know, I'm not gonna buy anything except for books, obviously. And my husband stopped me and said, well, if you don't buy books, you don't really have any other things that you're spending money on. So maybe we focus on the books. And I definitely did, and it definitely helped. So, which is all to say that I am a person who knows what it is to buy curriculum and books in excess and then regret it later. I think that when we first start homeschooling in particular, the impulse to overbuy is really strong because we are being exposed to so many different influencers, so many different voices, so many different curriculum fairs and before, you know, in-person uh, conferences where you go and, you know, to the vendor hall and everything looks shiny and new and brilliant and wonderful. And you will meet a lot of new homeschoolers who are very passionate about this curriculum or that including influencers. And sometimes because you respect the influencer, you respect your friend, or you admire their children, you think that it will fit for your kids and you buy it on impulse. And I will tell you the whole purpose of having a homeschool budget, one is financial if that is really a requirement for you, but two is to direct your purchasing power to what actually makes the most sense for your family. So one of the first things I would recommend that you do is write out a list of subjects per child for the next year. That being done, go ahead and write out a list of extracurricular activities for each child for the year. Write out a list of co-ops that you might be involved in, both online or in person. Write out a list of swimming classes and extracurriculars and horseback riding and Taekwondo and whatever else you're doing that might require money. Write out what your library fees might be, what 
any other event that you plan to go to might be. Like if you know you're going to go to the Chinese Lantern Festival or you know you're going to go to a Christmas light show, go ahead and parse that out. So I would have a page for curriculum per student with like a table split out by subject. One of the best and easiest tables to access, by the way, for this, and I'll pop it up on the screen here, is from Rainbow Resources. You can go there right now. I'll link it in the description box down below and just print it out for each student. It has a bunch of your subjects listed out on the left and you can put down actual prices of curriculum and your final choices in there and have a real sum total. Of course, you could do this easily in a composition notebook or on a piece of paper or on Excel or whatever floats your boat. The point is you have one piece of paper per student with all their different subject areas listed and the curriculum you might end up choosing. One of the best reasons to do this is that you will not make the mistake of buying three grammar curricula or three science curricula for grade one. You really only need one. I am a curriculum mixer, but part of the reason that I am a curriculum mixer is because one, curricula is sent to me for free for review, and two, I tended to overbuy when I first started homeschooling. My first year, when I would go to thrift stores, I would buy books for sixth grade. I was homeschooling a first grader. I had a three-year-old and like a baby. <laughs> and I was like, oh, in sixth grade, we will definitely enjoy using this book. In sixth grade, we should probably have standardized tests for Texas because that's where we lived at the time. And that was just foolish on my part, right? Having a list to stick to would have really, really helped me out there. So you have your curricula lists. You have a list of extracurriculars for each child as well. You have a list of events for the year that your family might participate in that you already know about. You have a list of co-op activities in real life and online classes that you might participate in. So if you know that you're gonna let each of your children choose an out school class or each of your children choose a summer camp for a week, allot that into your activities for the year. It's not very many pages. You'll probably have about 10 to 12 pages at the end if you have two to three kids. And you have all of this laid out. Now commit to filling in those charts before you start portioning out your budget. Decide what your actual essentials are. Generally, a grammar, reading, writing, math curriculums, those are essentials, right? So decide on the best choices for you and pop those into the chart. Don't pop in three in reading, just one. Decide on the best one. In our day and age, we have so many options for curricula and so many of them are good. And it is going to be okay if you miss out on something that's good. Part of the whole essentialist philosophy is that if it's not your best option, it shouldn't be an option. It shouldn't be something you're pursuing. You shouldn't be like trying to do every single reading curricula in an array like rays coming off a sun. You should try to pick the best one for you and shoot towards it like a shooting star. And you'll get further along and your progress will be faster. So. Try to stick to that chart. My second tip is once you have filled out these charts, let them be for a little bit. Do not run out and buy the curriculum for next year before you need to. This year with COVID-19, it has been a little bit complicated because some curricula have been selling out, but do not let fear guide your purchasing. Let it sit and percolate with you for a few weeks. And as you think about it, you will have doubts and worries and you'll see other shiny objects and all of these things. And if you have to replace something in one of those categories, do that then. Don't buy the first curriculum and think, oh, I wish I had bought this other one. Let it sit with you for a while. Research it as much as you can. Be happy with your decision before you hit that purchase button. Don't do any late night purchasing. Do not purchase curricula off your phone. I feel like we can purchase things off our phone so quickly. That's my other tip. Wait, have your list in front of you. Be ready to purchase when you do and really commit to your choice and try that out for as long as it's working. My other tip for homeschool budgeting throughout the year is while you are homeschooling and you are you know, going on Instagram or watching these YouTube videos and seeing recommendations for products, if there's something you're interested in for a coming year, write it down in a dedicated place. Have a homeschool curriculum, co-op, you know, extracurricular idea book. Separate it out by your children, separate it out by chapter, however your brain works, however it makes sense for you and really just jot down your ideas in there. I used to have a three ring binder and every time I would hear about a curriculum that I was interested in, sometimes I would just make a word file and 
cut and paste things that blog posts had said about that curriculum, things that Kathy Duffy's reviews had said. Um, I would cut and paste actual YouTube links to review videos so that I could go and think about it later. And if I didn't really want it by the time I made my dedicated curriculum chart, I would just sort of save it for later. But do not buy things without really going through that research process because you just end up with a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need. One of my best examples of this is Life of Fred. I heard about Life of Fred map books everywhere from everyone and they seemed so funny and all the posts about them said that people loved them and they were entertaining and and all of this stuff and so I bought the entire set um, straight off the bat I think in my first year of homeschooling and the first book was funny and entertaining but I also thought it was remarkably overpriced for what it was I didn't think it was a really good return on investment I didn't think it was a really good use of our time. So basically what I ended up doing with all the Life of Fred books is I gave them all to my son and put them in his room and said, read these if you want to. And he has read a few of them, but after a while the story got a little dull and he stopped and it was just overall a waste of money on my part. It was a math supplement that we truly did not need. My children are pretty strong in math. It goes far too slow for us. If I had watched a couple flip through videos and really like observed what it was about, I would have realized that straight off the bat. Instead of just going with other people's opinions and the general homeschooling idea that, you know, if so many people love it and if so many kids like it, then it must be great. So stay in tune with who your kids are, who you are, what your homeschool style is, when you evaluate what influencers say, when you see these beautiful table lay photos on Instagram, Really think about whether your child would play with those wooden toys for more than five seconds or whether they really need the $150 wooden calendar when, you know, a 99 cent calendar from the Dollar Tree could do the same thing. Evaluate like who you are. If that $150 wooden calendar is something that would bring you joy every day and bring your kid joy and would just enrich your homeschool experience and beautify your home and it makes sense for you in the budget, get it. There is nothing wrong with doing that. If that rainbow, you know, Waldorf rainbow thing is like the perfect tool for your toddler to play with and you can see them having like endless hours of enjoyment while you're teaching the older kids, great. You know, I am not judging any particular purchase. I, I am saying that when you make your purchases, make them with intention. I say this as a person who has often made purchases without intention at all, just on the, on the idea that a lot of people like it and wouldn't it be great if we had it too? I've also justified things because I do reviews, but none of those reasons are good reasons. Make a list, stick to the list, and the rest of the year, have like a notebook of ideas, flag the things you wanna go back to and review again. Have a page of geography curriculum and say like elementary and third grade and fifth grade and whatever, or middle and high, as loosey-goosey or as tightly framed as you want, but list out your ideas and go back to them as you do your final analysis so that you are not going willy-nilly. Another thing that happens sometimes when you buy willy-nilly is that you have completely forgotten about something that you thought was a great idea because you never wrote it down in a dedicated place. So just have like a composition notebook, a word file, something consistent, a consistent location, whether digital or on paper, to put all of these ideas, all of these things that you see. As for the actual monetary side of homeschool budgeting, I do not have a limit, as I said, but I do in my head sort of vaguely try to keep it under control. And the way I do this is very simply by having an email folder labeled homeschool expenses for this particular school year. And every single time I get an email from, you know, a, an online purchase or an online PDF purchase or a co-op receipt or anything like that, um, a ticket to an orchestra show, whatever is for homeschooling purposes, I put it into that file folder. And every month I kind of look at that file folder and just see what that all added up to. My initial curricula purchases from Rainbow Resources or any other curriculum company, I put into that file folder as well. So at the end of the year, I do have a running tally of how much I have spent. Another reason to do that is that if in your state you have some sort of tax advantage to doing that, you should probably keep a good record of those expenses. 
There are lots of free homeschool budgeting forms available online. If you type in homeschool budgeting form, you should be able to access quite a few free Excel spreadsheets that will do the adding for you all by itself, or like really pretty PDFs or Google Docs. It's really quite simple to do it on the rainbow resources sheet that I popped up because you just, you know, hand write in your complete uh, curricula costs and then add it all up at the end. And the other thing I would recommend doing is if you know ahead of time, well ahead of time, what you are thinking about for the next year. So for example, if it is the beginning of my kindergartner's year and I'm kind of getting ideas and I know sort of how much I'm going to want for her for first grade, try to plan that out at least loosely and add up to get a total. Divide that total by the number of months you have between now and the beginning of that next school year and try to save that money monthly so that when you get to the point where you're actually buying this huge boatload of curricula, you have the resources. It's not a huge strain at the very end. So those would be my homeschool budgeting tips, you guys. Keep a dedicated place for accruing all your ideas and videos and homeschool blogs and YouTube videos on any particular curricula that you're interested in have a list, stick to the list, don't fill in three options per subject area, just pick the best one for you and your family at that time, commit to it for a while. And then my third thing would be to, if you can forward predict about how much money you're gonna need when curriculum buying season comes, divide it out by the time you have to get there and try to save incrementally on the way. So I hope those tips were helpful, you guys. Thank you so much, Angie at Science Mama, for including me in this collab. Be sure to check out my friends' videos as well. I'm sure they will have great tips on homeschooling budgeting for you. They come from all different walks of life and all different perspectives. And I think that with budgeting in particular, it's really helpful to hear different perspectives so that you can implement what works best for you in your life. So I will link all their channels down below. Be sure to check them out. And as always, you guys, I wish you the very best day.